This is Mid-Atlantic Women in Agriculture's Wednesday webinar, Advocacy. Our presenter today is Michelle Walford, Communication Specialist at University of Delaware. All upcoming presentations, along with all of our archived presentations, can be found at our website. And a special thank you to our sponsors, Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit. Thank you for listening. Social media, that arena is where agriculture is taking quite a hit, in my opinion. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit. Um, and the theme of this whole presentation is don't sell it. And you're all selling something on some level, maybe at a farmer's market, it maybe we're selling to wholesalers or, or we're, we're, we're advocating is, is basically what selling is. But we don't want you to sell it directly. We want you to story tell it. And this is happening all across businesses now, the savvy businesses are using, if you go, for instance, on Facebook and look up Kleenex, now they're selling tissues. And they've started, somebody has gotten really smart there and they've started a whole um, a video se series on moving stories that you would grab a tissue for because they move you. So it's a wonderful way to, instead of just saying, our product's the best, and we do this, and aren't we wonderful, and aren't we great? What businesses are now adopting on social media is telling a story about your product, telling a story about you, the people who make this behind the scenes stories, and this is what connects with people. This is what research is finding out, so this is something that agriculture needs to do as well. So our overview today is on ag literacy or ag advocacy or advocating about. It's a little bit of a tongue twister for me. We're going to look at who is telling the stories on social media and are the stakeholder, and I've used this for extension, are extension voices there and what do they know and what do they think they know. We need to understand who our audience is because the audience out there is changing. I'm a baby boomer. Um, I'm not driving the market anymore. It's uh, maybe for medicines and arthritis pains and things like that, but the people who are buying food now are, are younger families, so they're millennial audiences. So we're going to kind of take a look at what we can do to advocate. Now, my generation uh, may or may not use social media. The new generation's social media is the primary. We have, um, my generation has varying rates of internet success, but the new generation, of course, is extremely connected. And you can see these as I scroll through them. The old, old fogies like to have face-to-face -face interaction. Um, we're, the new generation is much more comfortable. Um, my daughter never calls me. She texts me all the time. So that's just what she prefers. So it's, it's, it's something I had to, to accept as that's her preferred method. Reading papers, the new generation, very few. There, there's always going to be some, but very few uh, today do that, and that is reflected in the fact that newspapers are laying people off, and reporters now, and or writers are having to try to find a new way to make a living. And uh, we always received our sources, um, our news, and our information from various sources, and they're receiving it very, very quickly today. We are more cautious, and that's not to say that all young people are impulsive, but as far as news delivery, it is, it is more impulsive. There is a generational divide. Um, this is a slide from the Center for Food Integrity, and they were talking about 1968 being a pivotal year when the authority came from an office, the government. Um, you received your news was formal. In my day, it was Walter Cronkite, Shed Hunkley, and David Brinkley, or Frank Reynolds on ABC. You know, they said something was happening. You believed it. From '68 on, and especially in recent years, everything is the the, the authorities are questioned. Instead, your authority comes from the relationships you have with people. Those are the people you trust. You don't trust people. Don't trust the government anymore. They don't trust science. They trust the people that they have relationships with. Um, there's no single social voice. It is um, people now go to the blogs that they feel or the information sources that they feel align with their beliefs. So, if you're, for instance, if politics. 
um, Republicans might prefer Fox and Democrats might prefer CNN or MSNBC. So we go to the sources that verify how we already believe. And that makes us feel comfortable, but then they're not getting a well-rounded um, a portrait of, of what things are. So you get things, you get, uh, these are two recent um, uh, films, very popular films. One is called Food Inc. A lot of college kids have seen this. I believe Jason, Jason Lusk at the University of Oklahoma says that, in fact, this Food Inc. is required um, watching in for, for incoming students. So it's very interesting because this is what younger people, this is what they're watching and this is what how they're def learning to develop their attitudes about agriculture. Forks Over Knives is uh, a film that advocates plant-based dieting. Plant-based plant diet, excuse me, not dieting. There is a credibility gap going on. So uh, those of us who are uh, let me see that little tag here. Those of us who are involved in, in traditional agriculture, production agriculture, we will say things like our methods are safe, our farms are family run, we care about our land and animals. We say these things, but this is what they're hearing. They're hearing. They're hearing us, but they're not believing us. They're taking in what we say differently than how we think they are. So we just need to be aware that when we say these things, we have to back it up with something. And what advocacy will tell you is you have to back it up with not just facts, but with, with a relationship that you need to develop with your, with your customer or that audience. So how should we tell our story? There's many, many ways. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to see how you're using websites and social media, traditional media. So these are some of the ways that you, you can tell your story. Um, do you have an about feature on your website? You should. It maybe will be a, a vintage photograph of your great grandfather's house, the original barn that maybe isn't there anymore, but people want to hear that story. So it, you want to use your website, if you have one, to have an about feature it may even have two. You may have an about and you might have a, our history and throw in some family photographs. This is the kind of thing that people love and they help. it helps form a connection with you. Um, are you using social media? You should and you should at least identify one platform, at least one that you could use or someone in your organization could use and it might be a role that you assign to a grandchild or, or a child. How do you use traditional media? Um, if you aren't an employee journalist, you can still maybe offer to write a guest column or send in an, uh, an editorial essay. A lot of uh, papers, at least the ones that I see, are very interested in, in having that kind of content. Um, are you an ambassador? Where do you go? Do you maybe go to a school or, or talk to a 4-H club? But, but even outside of the traditional things we think of like 4-H or FFA, where could you go to maybe speak about what you do? Um, write letters, letters to the editors, letters to your representatives. These still count. Uh, and writing letters, I would also extend that to say writing comments in social media. People, we always used to joke when I took journalism that people will do two things. They will always look at the comics, they will always read the obituaries, and they always read the um, letters to the editor. And in social media, they always, people read the comments. So that, that, that is a venue that you could use for social media. And then, what does the appearance of your farm look like? Take an honest look at your, at your organization, at your business. Um, your operation, what's it look like from the street? Pretend that you're a stranger, you don't know anything about your business and you're riding down the road. What does your place look like? Is it, is it, what is it communicating to an outsider that might be driving by? A lot of people just don't have time for that or they let it go a little bit, but appearances do matter. So who are you? Uh, you're a lot of people here today. I, we have some uh, vineries. I know some people grow, have farmers, they grow farmers markets, they have you pick, so they do all kinds of different things. Um, 
Um, this is Lavender Fields. It's a local business where they grow lavender and then they sell value-added lavender products. So we have farm here, farm families, garden centers, creamery, etc. You name it, you've done it. We know who we are here at the Women in Ag. So this is who we are. These aren't made up photographs. This is really who we are. These are the people that I know and have built relationships with. But who do they, who does the outside think we are? When polled, now this slide comes from U.S. Farmers, Ranchers, and Alliance. This is a couple years old, but they did a, they did a survey of people and asking people to, to translate in one word or less. What comes to mind when you think of American agriculture? Now the larger the word, the more popular the word is, the more popular the impression is. So you can see right away, pesticides is a big one. Big business, mass production, too many subsidies are the leading ones, but the other ones here aren't really good. Corn, okay, safety, hardworking, those are all great, but look how tiny it is. So people now think agriculture, and we all know this, this is not a secret, that all production ag is big ag, it's corporate, corporate is big, corporate is ugly. And, of course, you have all these pesticides, all these sides, herbicides, fungicides, um, et cetera. And danger, danger, beware, beware. And I hear this quite often, just listening to people talking, especially younger people. This is just some images I grabbed when I searched for American agriculture on Google. Um, this is just one of thousands of photographs and images, um, again, for, for people who are farmers in chains, this being beholding to um, corporate, the hypodermic needles, very, very big in anti-agriculture. And I'm not saying that this is 100%, but this is how it is, um, the Franken food, Monsanto is, is considered quite quite um, an evil empire, um, the Franken food um, moniker or tag has really stuck for the people who are anti-GMOs. So this is the kind of um, imagery that circulates on social media. This I just took off uh, Facebook two days ago. Uh, there is a page on there called Raw for Beauty, and Raw for Beauty promotes eating fresh organic foods. Nothing wrong with that. But this is the picture they show and they show they they want to show this on social media. Nineteen thirteen corn was hundred percent farmer owned. Now look at it. It's corporate. And look at these people in their hazmat suits. Now I've been here fifteen years with the University of Delaware. I've ridden by lots and lots of cornfields and farm I have never ever seen anybody dressed up in an outfit like this. This is staged. This is staged, but it's it's staged with a message to, to scare. And this is the kind of thing that people see and go, oh my gosh, if they have to wear that when they're out there, it's not safe to eat. That's the message. And it's something that we need to be aware of that is happening. Um, the, again, just some other screenshots here. Uh, animal cruelty, just say no to GMOs. I should have put up a picture because there is a picture that's put up. And so here, everybody, here is your non-GMO corn. And it's a picture of corn. The kernels are all discolored and they're all unevenly spaced. And there's like five or six um, 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 and I see someone's raised a hand, so we'll answer questions afterwards. But and there were worms all over it, and they said, "Here, here's your anti-GM." So we'll talk a little bit about GM. But this is what's become um, uh, very prominent in social media. This is Chipotle. Chipotle is a food restaurant, food chain, Mexican food chain. I finally had a. Chipotle on my travels at the airport. I wanted to see what they're all about. But their whole thing is we 
we serve non-GMO food, we serve organic food only. Well, they've produced their own television show. Netflix has House of Cards and Chipotle has Farmed and Dangerous. So you can see, and it and it's just shows this, this large corporate J.R. Ewing type character and he's, he's evil and all he cares about are, is money and profits and it's about modern agriculture. So it's really meant to scare and disturb the viewers about how how food is produced, but you know, so that's why you need to eat at Chipotle because we don't we don't engage with this type of practice. This is a screenshot called factoryfarms.org, and so you see that .org, and you think, well, it, this got to be true, and they show that, uh, for instance, in Sussex County, that this is extreme danger, danger um, uh, factory farm location. Um, and I know these poultry farmers, I've met them, they're real people, they own their farms, their families, their children go out and work in these, in these farms. So, but this here, it, you see it, and if you, if you go and visit it, it's factoryfarmsmap.org, if you want to check it out. But you can see that this is the kind of information that, it, that is being shared out there. Uh, this is a rat. Uh, our mouse, a lab mouse, this was a uh, very famously produced um, report on glyphosate in, in food and it was, debun it was debun debunked, completely debunked. This scientist did not disclose that he had a financial interest in proving that glyphosate was, or GM corn, I think it was GM corn or glyphosate, that it was dangerous. So he had a financial interest, number one, which he should have disclosed. He also used lab rats that were highly prone to cancer. When this started to become peer-reviewed after he published it, um, the, the scientific community really came down very hard on him. Um, so just because a scientist, but because he was a scientist and he came from, say, MIT, there's another one, MIT scientist, I think that's the one I'm talking about, an MIT scientist who produced something that um, um, GMOs produce autism. And he had uh, an autism, he had a financial interest in proving that. And, but, you know, you see that constantly, and it was debunked, again, just like this one. Um, but it's, once it's out there, then it's constantly shared, and it's telling you, look, there is a science that says this is wrong, even though it's been debunked on social media, it stays out there. So um, you have to be very careful when you see something on social media. You want to do your due diligence before sharing it. And of course, I don't think anybody here would share something like that, but other people do. I, I've been talking to college students who are at the, at the College of Ag. Like, before you send something out on social media, do a little checking to find out what's being talked about about this topic. Um, this is another, they're actually in, I think it was in Iowa where they're, they're asking farmers now, when you put a sign like this outside your cornfield, you're, you're, and this is what you do because you want to say this is, this is the kind of corn we're growing, this is this particular type of seed, but imagine when you're riding by and, and a non-agriculture person sees this, they can make, they could draw the conclusion that this is a corporate farm. So it's not that, it, there are some people who are actually saying don't put these signs up anymore. That, that's a discussion to have, but what you could do is use your, your property to put other signs. Uh, let people know this is a family farm. You know, um, so you could use your, your acreage and your roadside um, to, to also share some information about your operation. So who are these people and how should we talk to them? Let me say right up front, they are not the enemy. They are not the enemy. It is nothing wrong. There are legitimate physical reasons, philosophical reasons, religious reasons to choose to eat a certain way. So I want to make it very clear. I am not saying and never will say that if you choose to be a vegan, that's a wrong thing to do or if you want to eat raw food uh, or plant-based diet, that's fine. If you're a vegetarian, that's fine. We love organic farmers and customers cooperative extension. We help production farmers. We also help, we have small growers that come here, Gordon Johnson, our 
fruit and vegetable specialist. Conduct, they, we conduct workshops. Our weed specialists conduct workshops telling people, if you want to grow, or here's, how you, here's how you combat weeds. You use cover crops instead of herbicides. So we're all about promoting choices. And these people, if you have this way of life and this is your belief system for whatever reason, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. They can, they do, and they should coexist with traditional or production agriculture. It's when they demonize, when, the, when certain groups, and not every vegan is going to demonize what we might do for a living, but some of them do. Some of the activists in social media do demonize what we do, and that's what we're taking exception here. This is, a, um, again, this comes from the Center for Food Integrity. I highly recommend, I'll give you the link to it, that you look at this, their website, and you will see these, this chart re reproduced a lot. And I usually kind of zone out when I see diagrams like this, but this is important. How do we talk about agriculture? And how do we earn trust and earn respect? We talk about economics. You, you will see a farmer talking about, oh, our yield, our corn yields were great. Or, of course, you're not in business to lose money. You're in business to make money. And so to talk about economics, and we drive, we are the, Delaware has the, agriculture is the largest industry in Delaware, and it's something to be very, very proud of. But when we talk about agriculture, we have to be mindful um, that's not the only way we should be talking about agriculture. The other one is scientifically verified. So this would be your universities, your, your land-grant universities, cooperative extension offices, your, C your um, CCAs, your crop advisors. They're going to say, you can do this. We're going to give you some science. We're going to give you some scientific tools and some research to help you survive and make your farm productive and profitable. These are good things. But when you want to convince an outsider that agriculture and agriculture products are good, that you, can, that you can trust what we're saying, these two things alone will not work. You need to connect with people on an emotional level, or what's called a value similarity. So you could talk about this being... Um, we sprayed this chemical to get this herbicide so that we could have higher yields. They tell us it's safe. And, they're, and the, the people out there are going to go, yeah, 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 I don't trust you. So the, how do you get them to trust you? And you do that with shared values. So in other words, they need to meet you. They need to form a relationship with the grower. Um, this can be done through social media, through video through attending farmers markets, they actually, um, you, get, you basically say, it's okay, you, you should be concerned. We, so these people here need to tell these people, it's okay that you're concerned. I respect that you're concerned. Let me tell you that, you know, I've raised my family on these crops. We, we grow soybeans. We eat this chicken. Um, I'm very, very confident my family cares about how we raise our chickens. We are taking classes to be more responsible. We take nutrient management classes, for instance, to keep um, to to because you you care about the Chesapeake. Uh, a good example would be if you're a poultry grower, and you're, of course you're going to pr promote poultry, but you might say to a critic, "Look, on Fridays, Friday or Saturdays, my family and I we like we like to go to a crab house just like you do, and so we care about." the Chesapeake Bay. We care about those things. We don't want to pollute the Chesapeake. We don't pollute the Chesapeake. And, you know, this is my state too, and that is my bay, and that's my waterway. So you share that value. And when you have an opportunity to share your personal values and your belief system, then that's where you bridge the trust. So even though you might use herbicides or a little bit of pesticides because you're trying to keep worms out or whatever, the, the, you're trying to deter a pest, if they have an opportunity to talk to you and you validate their concerns but come back with them with, with a reasonable explanation, that's what bridges that gap. So this is very, very important, and it's at the root of all the agriculture 
agricultural communications. You want to make sure that you convey that. So again, it's, it's trust. If they have trust in you, if you if they have similar values, yes, you can be comp you can be competent, and you know all of the science and all of that. But it's they're going to trust you when they when you when they can build a confidence with you, and then they will give you a social license and a, and the freedom to operate your farm. They they can't not give you take away that freedom. But what I'm trying to say here is they'll say, oh okay, now I understand. Well, that seems reasonable to me. So, okay, you do spray some herbicides or here, or you, you spray some pesticides, but I've met you now. I see how you run your farm. And a lot of people, for instance, just want to buy local. It isn't necessarily organic. So th this is, this is the, the important thing that you need, to, you need to know at the basis of all of your communication going forward is Share your value system, and the way you do that is sharing your story. It's talking about who you are, what you do, and what you believe in. So this is just another uh, shot from U.S. Farmers, Ranchers, and Alliance, and these are words that we can lose, and this would be a better way of maybe explaining them. So we keep our animals healthy. We use seeds that grow stronger and are maybe more resilient, and the products, this particular seed of this crop, we don't have to spray chemicals. We don't have to spray um, herbicides or pesticides because it's been it's been tweaked a little bit. So it, it's again being able to have an opportunity to have a conversation and using the right kind of language. I want to show you this is a, a true story. This happened last year and it happened to me. As a journalist, I listen to left, medium, and right wing. I listen to it all. I like to expose myself to all points of view. This was from Huffington Post, which is considered to be more progressive, sort of left-leaning um, news website. And they did an article on why chickens look different today, and here's the reason why. Now, this was on their website. Shows a picture of the kinds of chickens, and then the article. The article was actually quite factual. It said that there were no hormones, there were no, very very little antibiotics, only pr done for preventative purposes if there's there's an outbreak of some sort. Um, but the article was pretty uh, straightforward and honest. It said that it, the chickens have gotten bigger because of selective breeding, just as though. I have a Siamese cat, and Siamese cats used to be really round-faced. They called them apple heads. Today, Siamese show Siamese. They're very triangular and skinny. That's been done over a series of years and selective breeding. And this is essentially how chickens have changed their size. They've looked for broader-chested chickens that can grow faster. They're feeding them the same thing as they've always fed them. They do not feed hormones. It is illegal, as those of you who grow chickens know. So this was the website. Again, it had 162 comments. People, it was presented as an article so that people had to read it. And again, I didn't have any issues with it. I was actually surprised that Huffington Post posted it, so I was really happy about that. Then I see it on Facebook, and all of these news organizations will post on Facebook with links so that you can go back to their website. I want you to look closely at this headline here. So this would be the article, or if it were a paper, this would be the paper headline. So now let's look at how the same article was presented on Facebook. Chickens really don't look like they used to, so the headline has changed. The social media manager posted, kind of horrifying, huh? Now why did the social media manager do that? She wants clicks. There's no article, so you have to click the article to read the article that I just showed you. The problem is on, on social media, because of its rapid nature, people see pictures, they took the bait here, and without reading the article, they started commenting. And it doesn't show it here, but there were thousands of comments. So yours truly, trying to be an advocate types in. It's not horrifying at all. 
No, they don't use hormones in the feed. It is selective breeding. It's why it's a difference why we have, actually it's the wrong breed here I use, but my point was it's sort of the way we do cats and dogs. It's selective breeding. 92 people, which is pretty good, liked it. So I was pleased with that. I want you to notice how many people saw it, 14,442, six, almost 7,000 shares. But this set a tone here. So people saw this, and they saw this, and they started commenting. They didn't even read the article. And I'll show you why. So it goes on. So I'm, I'm in this conversation, and I said it. And people were saying, this is why I'm not going to ever eat chickens. They use hormones. This guy here, Matt McNeils, says, I can vouch for them using them, meaning hormones, being that I've seen it in person, not to mention I'm friends with someone, abbreviates, who owns a large chicken company. You best believe they do. Steroids, too, and antibiotics in every meal. So I'm like, who is this guy who's vouching for this industry? So I check him out. I click on his name. I can't find a single thing. He doesn't say who he is, where he works, what his education level is. He's got 12 likes, so 12 people agreed with him. But he can vouch for it because he knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, or he says he knows one person. And you better believe that they do. So I, I reply, it's illegal to use hormones or steroids. It's not used here on the Delmarva poultry poultry industry. My likes now are declining. I had 92 before. Now I'm down to one. And then some other guy had said something, and I said, inbreeding and selective breeding are different. There was a guy named Daryl. And I said, and then somebody accused me of passing on propaganda. And I said, I don't pass on propaganda. Some farmers here grow organic and some don't. I'm just telling the truth. Birds are not given hormones or antibiotics in their feed, period. So this person, now, so they can see who I am. No, Michelle Dorsey, it's not in the feed. They inject it. The hypodermic needle comes back out. Um, she says she, act, and they're talking about me now. She actually thinks people believe her. They do use hormones and antibiotics. The evidence is out there, and it's certainly not a secret at this point. What, what's the evidence? The evidence is in social media. It's somebody saying something. People now are believing each other. They're not believing the government. They're not believing science. They're believing their peers. So th this is where it gets really frightening. And then, and this, and then this oh, I messed up the slide. Darn it, I wanted to show you. So there, there was one more slide, and the woman actually says, can you believe it? Look where she works. She works for a, a college of ag at a university. Of course she's going to uh, say that. So you, you, I can't win. I Absolutely, in this kind of dialogue, you do what you can. You try to tell people the truth. Some people believed me. But I will tell you the vast majority of these comments in here, and there were probably all, there were probably maybe 10,000 comments, the vast majority of them were, I'll never eat chicken, it's poison, it's not natural, they do all these awful things. So you really can't win in a, in a case like this. It's very, very difficult in social media. But they're not the enemy. I think I already showed you that. Um, they are activists, that, however, a lot of them are. They're very engaged. There's quite a few of them. They're infiltrated social media, and they, um, they dominate the media stream. They will use photos. They will use videos. They may not use current things. Um, you will often see it happened with a Tyson product about a month ago where somebody did a hidden video and they showed a guy slamming down trays of little baby chicks and slamming them down real hard and one worker kicked them. You know, that's one out of thousands. And when that kind of stuff happens, we need to be able to, to come right up and say, that's, that's wrong. If I'm a poultry farmer, I'm right out there selling. That doesn't happen in our farm. We would never tolerate that. But, you know, one apple spoils the whole bunch. And so when these images are out there, the first thing that, that poultry farmers should be doing is putting out their own videos saying, look at how well we run our operation. 
there's my son in the poultry house, there's my daughter in the poultry house, our whole family works here. It's not dangerous to be in there. They're breathing the same air as the chickens. So we need to be proactive. We shouldn't be waiting for a negative ad to come out. We need to be as transparent as possible to show who we are, what we're doing. Now in the case of poultry, your poultry integrator might not want you to put something on social media, but as much as we can, we need to make the connection that these are family farms. So when you're waking up in the morning, and maybe you have poultry houses, and maybe they, you can view them from your house, you wake up in the morning and maybe the swing sets in the backyard and you go out and you take a picture out of your back kitchen window and it shows your poultry houses and you say, this was my view this morning. I said, look at how the fog is lifting and isn't the field, aren't the fields beautiful. It puts you as a person on that farm and you may just be talking about the weather or the sunset, but it connects a real person to, to the farm operation and that's what we need to do. It's just a little tiny, that's one little teeny tiny way to make a connection with people. Um, here's some things about talking to the media. If the media approaches you, uh, they know that you make, you grow a certain kind of product or they know you're a farmer and maybe there's a national news story going out and they want a reaction to you. Um, if you have a family farm, um, the wife is probably better as a spokesperson than the husband. This is just research from uh, uh, Center for Food Integrity. Your Oprah Winfrey, they call it audience, the millennial mother, the consumer, is the best person to talk on behalf of the farm, far better than the grandfather or the husband. When you talk to your audience, you, you want to talk to the audience, not to the reporter. A single reporter may be coming at your home or a, a news crew, uh, always remember when you're talking to that reporter, you're talking to an invisible audience, but a real audience behind them. So you want to always talk to that audience, not, not to the reporter. You're not trying to convince the reporter is what I'm saying. You want to talk about your experience, not stats or public surveys. So if somebody came up to you with a microphone that said 75% of Americans don't want to eat GMOs, GMO foods, what would you say? You might want to turn around and say, well, in my experience, 100% of Americans want, that I know want to eat healthy food and know that it's safe. And my children have been raised on the food I grow. So you're putting yourself, you're invoking your children, you're telling the reporter that you're a family, and so you're kind of turning that statistic around and saying, sure, and you could, you could acknowledge, absolutely, they have a concern. It, they're looking at what's being said today about agriculture. I'd be concerned too, but I want you to know that in my experience, um, this is the kind of values I have. This is the kind of food I grow. This is the kind of farm. I'm a third generation, fourth generation farmer, and we care about this, and we care about that. And so you want to share your values and your concerns. You want to be a human being. Again, you're making this connection to that box down at the bottom. You're not talking about yields um, and how much money and you got this year. You're talking about, I'm really glad, or even if the reporter's coming to you talking about how we have record corn growing this year because of record rain and all that. And, Yes, we grew corn, and I'm really so happy to be able to, to grow food that's going to help our state and grow families and so forth and so on. So you never um, always want to share that. Uh, you want to use short analogies, if you can, to tell a story. Newspapers, this was growing up when I went to journalism school, always said that newspapers typically wrote for a sixth grade level. You need to kind of have that in the back of your mind. You may be very, very sciencey. You want to, you don't want to dumb that down. I don't like that phrase. But if you get too scientific, um, it's going to, it goes over people's head. Again, it's the emotional connection that's going to make people trust you more than a science statistic. Never ever dismiss their concerns. Never call them kooks or they're crazy. Oh, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, oh, those tree-hugging, left-wing environmentalists, they're all a bunch of nuts. You never want to say anything like that. You might feel that sometimes if, you feel, if agriculture is um, under attack, but you never want to do that. They have the right to be concerned. You acknowledge it, and then you tell, you know what, let me, and let, and let me tell you why you shouldn't be concerned. So this is what you need to do. Um, if you're 
going to be interviewed for broadcast, set your stage a little bit. Make sure that they're videotaping you um, in, a, in a nice setting. You don't want to have rusty tractor material laying around. So, you know, try to find a nice, nice place for them to. Um, they may suggest something, but you have the right to say, oh, I think we could film me over here with this in the background. Throw on a little swing set, you know, let, let people know that this is a family farm. Um, let the kids run around the background through the corn. That kind of stuff is, again, it's a little bit stagecraft, but it, it's, it's letting people know that there's a family behind this farm that there's real human beings growing and working and making a living from it and that, and that you have a connection to the land. And always use value statements first over economic statements. When I took an engaged training with the uh, Center for Food Integrity, if you ever get a chance to take engaged training, do so. But they had a list of, of, of questions and one of them would be, um, uh, because market prices, farmers, receive haven't kept up with inflation. Farms are bigger than they used to be a few. Like most farmers, I've changed my operation in order to keep my farm profitable for, and provide for my family. That would be, a, if that's a statement you make to the press, that would be considered an economic statement. It's not the best statement to make. You should always try to do something that's a little bit more um, valuable. So you might say something like, treating animals with the best care allows me to provide consumers with abundant, safe, and affordable food and allows me to make a living so I can provide for my family. So it's mostly a value statement there. You're letting, that, you're letting the public know that you care about the earth, you care about the environment, you care about the animals, and you care about providing and feeding the world. And we use feeding the world a lot, uh, but it's not the best. Um, I see bumper stickers all the time, farmers feed the world. And it's very true, but that statement, most people don't care about that. They, they want to care about what you are as a human being. So that's the most important thing. If you have a website, you should have an About Us section where you will share your family photos, maybe a history of your business. Um, you also should have a value statement, particularly if you are growing or raising or working with animals of any kind. You want to have a statement, we believe in this. Um, something that states that you care about the animals that are in your custody. Something that establishes your stewardship. Um, links to your everyday life. So you could have links to that. So if you had a Facebook page, or you, you could have that on your website. I'm jumping around just a little bit here. So the path forward, when, if they have, you're talking to people and they have concerns, or if a reporter's coming to you, and voice and maybe quoting concerns while well, I'm reporting because of the concerns that are in the media. This is your chance to acknowledge those concerns, showing that you're part of a, a group of people who are committed to continuous improvement. Talk about the classes you take and you've, how you've learned differently than what your grandfather did and, 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 and why that's a good thing. And change, your di change the language that you use and begin to have a dialogue with people. Do respond if something is negative that comes out, like a viral video. Always respond to it. Be respectful. Say that that upsets me. I'm a poultry grower, and that upsets me. Express your values. State that it's not typical. State how you do it differently. Maybe post a link of how you operate. And you don't obviously you don't want to call the the the, the person who posts the picture uh, or the video a liar or question them. Um, because that's just going to make, that's going to put you back into that argument of you're wrong and I'm right. So it's much, much better to, to just say, I'm sorry that happened, but the, the poultry growers that I know and that I work with that are my friends and my neighbors, they don't run their business that way. And that's all you really, that's all you can really say about something like that. They want to know, as again, who you are what your values are, and you want to be able to share your story, and that is, you can do, and this was the screen I was looking for, it's a little disorganized, but the Center for Food Integrity surveyed that these kinds of statements, while absolutely 100% true, people don't seem to care, because they go, yeah, you just want to sell to the world, so you have to kind of make these are on your bumper sticker, that's fine, I'm not saying you have to take them down, but this can't be the only way that you advocate. 
because it's not an effective way to advocate. Advocate. So fine, put your bumper stickers on, but you've got to go a little bit more than that. So this, this was just another example of this, again, with poultry, which seems to be a real hotbed issue. This is Kevin Fleming. He is a National Geographic photographer based out of Delaware, and he posts pictures. This was his picture, a, a series of images on, on the kind of jobs people have in Delaware. So this was just one of many. He had firefighters, and he had, guard, he had different people. And he was just talking about his... Um, his photography, and he was looking for, you know, talk about his artwork, but it descended very quickly into um, a negative discussion about ag about farming. Into I'll, this is why I'll never eat chicken. Look at that, that's awful, and it it just really quickly descended. There were quite a few, and you can see some of the comments here. Uh, this is so unnatural and so sad, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a sea of misery and sickness. Well, there's no sickness here. There's a lot, a lot of chickens, but this family member is walking through. The sunlight's pouring in. Um, I again, I picked up here and a different port, different profile picture at this point, and I said free-range chicken because a lot of people were talking about we need to have them all in our backyards and grow them like we used to back in the good old days. And I just type, piped in here. Um, why backyard flocks might not be the best choice. Absolutely factual. I didn't get any likes or, or disagreements at all. It's sort of, I was the last commenter on that. But this, this will just show you how quickly an innocent normal photograph can quickly um, take on a conversation of its own. Um, I won't go into this. You can read it on the slide on the PDF because I want to keep going. I'm getting getting behind here, but this was about Chipotle commercial, and I had talked, this woman here was a reporter, and she talked about the uh, poultry being um, corporate owned, and then Sue, this is Sue Ockles, she's a poultry grower out of Delaware, she piped in after attending one of the workshops that we, we talked about, and I was so proud of her because she, she talked about, I'm not a sharecropper, and this was a, her value statement. We constantly check on them. We watch the air quality. In other words, she put her value statement in there, and then this reporter came back and kind of calmed down her rhetoric a little bit. So you can, you may only convince one or two people, but it's one or two people that maybe wouldn't have and would have kept on going. So it's, this whole workshop is to encourage you, if you are on social media, to tell your story more. So you definitely want to enter the conversation. So today we hope that you will blog. Think about blogging. We have workshops uh, already recorded on how to create a WordPress blog. Post photographs. Anytime you can post a photograph or a video of your life and what you do. I'm out here picking the grapes that are going to go into my wine. Here's, here's Bessie, the cow. And um, this is part of our, the ice cream that we use. You want to you want to do that any chance you can. The photographs, in particular, are very very powerful, and so we you need to be on some of these platforms so that we hope that you will feel comfortable going back in and looking at some of the other um, webinars we've done, and maybe start sharing your story on these platforms because we need these voice we need your voices on here um, to counterbalance what's being said about agriculture. So social media is the way to go. We want to see not this, but we want to see more of this. Yeah. I'm taking that apple and there's a subsequent picture of her biting it right off the tree. Families. There's a poultry farm. It's not a factory farm. It's a family behind that. Not this kind of stuff, which proliferates social media. Um, again, this is just um, pushing. If you do have Facebook pages or a Twitter Twitter account, um, yes, you might want to say what's on sale. That's called pushing out your information. But to really succeed on social media, you need to pull which means you're, you're extracting, you're getting, you want a dialogue. You're pulling 
for talk. You're asking the audience to comment. So you might ask them to, you might ask a question or ask them to comment, um, retweet, share other people's content. That's how you get people to share your content. So a little bit, you can see more about this, but you just don't want to go on social media and say, this is on sale, this has come up, this is available now. You really want to have a dialogue with people on social media. Here are some of the tools and platforms that I feel are priority that maybe you could use. Twitter. Twitter, actually more than Facebook. Facebook, for a lot of reasons, is difficult for a business. But Twitter, there is no filtering. The, the challenge with Twitter, it's so fast if you're following a lot of people um, that they may not keep, that people might not keep up. But you can, you can follow conversations about food. There's a food chat that's once a, mo once a month. There's a food chat. I'll talk about that a little bit. And I want to talk about Flickr. So we'll just keep going here. These are some common hashtags. But any keyword, so you can go up and search for soybean. And you will find soy the conversations that are going on about soybeans. And you'll find positive and you'll find negative. And so these are some uh, hashtags that we use in Delaware. NetDE is a catch-all for the state. I think Maryland uses the same thing. It's pretty much the keyword in the postal code that follows it. But the Ag Chat and Food Chat and Garden Chat are very, very good. USDA also has one that they've been promoting called Rural Made. So if, you're, if you've created something and it's been grown and made on your farm and you want to share it out on social media, you might want to use that hashtag because they're curating that. So this is Twitter. It's a very quick, rapid microblogging. It is where reporters are and legislators are. It's a younger demographic. So this is um, a little bit different audience than Facebook. And if you use certain keywords, people will follow it. Uh, so you do want to, um, I'm a big Twitter believer. I think it has a lot of, uh, a lot of, it's a great tool to help us advocate, let's put it that way. Um, they have organized chats. One's called Garden Chat, which is every Monday night. Uh, food chat is once a month, and then there's Ag Chat. So they have different themes. So last, last night on Ag Chat, it was about, um, the swine industry and pork. So people talked about that. So that's when people will jump in and know that expertise. So these are just some of the companies that are on Twitter. Here's the times for the, the, the three Twitter chats that I go on a lot. I don't always participate in food chat, but I, I will monitor these. And even during the off time, so on a Wednesday, and I want to maybe, if I've got a great photograph that I've taken of a guard, somebody's garden, I still will use that hashtag because they will aggregate that and they'll co collect it and actually present it. So you can be part of a conversation by following these hashtags or using them or both. These are just some things that I use with Twitter. So I show my uh, like our extension agent working with kids community gardening. So letting people know what Cooperative Extension does. So people don't really know what we do. So we're, we use photographs to kind of explain that. And people love plant IDs or insects. So these are great ways of just going and putting, putting a photograph out. Flickr is a fantastic platform to use. It is 100% free. It gives you a uh, one terabyte of storage, which is amazing. It's a backup to, for instance, I don't keep any f uh, pictures on my iPhone anymore because it'll, I'll fill it up in a, in a week. Um, so I move all my pictures over to Flickr. Um, you can create a Flickr account for your business. So if you have a winery, if you have a creamery, you can have a Flickr account. And you can open up um, and upload your pictures. But here's the thing, you want to upload your photographs, don't upload them with the camera file name. So this would be the original name of the file, DSC 101, DSC 102. You want to go in there, you could actually do it before you upload, but you want to do it afterwards. So if you had a vineyard, maybe a produce stand, a farmer's market, creamery, how many of you, and I don't have the chat box right now, but just rhetorically speaking, how many of you go on Bing or or Google and search for a photograph, maybe to use on your blog or your website or your child's um, book report. 
um, people search on Google, it's this, Google Images is the second largest search engine. The people go on it all the time, all the time. So if they were to search for Delaware ice cream and you had a creamery, would your pictures show up? What about your wine? What about um, whatever product you might make? So if you upload your pictures, uh, here's I, so I did a search for Delaware ice cream. And these were the images that I picked, that, that came up. I didn't pick them. This is what came up. Now, if you have a business, a creamery, you could get your picture up here. But there's not too many businesses up here. So how do you get your, how do you get your images up here? By it's how you name your, your image. So here, if this was Vander, if I had called this a Vanderwind's ice cream or Vanderwind's vanilla fudge, if I were a creamery, and you could replace this with winery or replace this with vinery, uh, with um, lavender, I would take a picture of every single flavor I have. I would name it Delaware, um, Hopkins, Vanilla Fudge, Orange Sherbert. I would have pictures vertical and horizontal. I would have pictures of all 50 flavors. 200 pictures of it, so that when pe and and name them search terms, so that when people were searching for a picture of an ice cream cone, yours would come up, not somebody else's. So this is a way to also drive business to your website, and of course, right there, when you look at the picture, and I, maybe I want to use that in my book report, I could visit the page, I could download the image, it might be copyrighted, that's a different different issue, but here's this is a page to your website. But if you, if you name this, if you uploaded this as DSC 101, no one would ever find this photograph. So you want to, do you want to label your pictures? Um, this, and again, this could be wholesome pictures of your, your operation, your family operation. Label it as, with as many keywords as possible. You can also add tags, which makes it even more searchable. But you can get up in very high into the Google search engine very, very quickly. So again, if I were a local creamery, I would be taking pictures, portrait, landscape, close up, backwards. If I have people eating the ice cream, I'm going to get their photo releases to, in order to do that. But as far as ice cream cones are concerned, or, or peppers, or tomatoes, or whatever you're growing, you don't need photo releases for them. You just take them and put them up. So. Think about doing that. It's a way of advocating. Um, so we'll skip that. You also want to go on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is sort of think of LinkedIn as a professional platform. It's like Facebook, but it's without the kitty cat videos and without the politics. It's people talking about who they are and what they do. And you can follow certain groups. But it's a good way of connecting with other people who are involved in agriculture. I use Instagram a lot. These are pictures I took, but Instagram is becoming, uh, especially for younger people, and these are the people who are going to be buying your product and going into a store. Are they going to pass by the chicken? Are they going to pass by the soybeans because it doesn't say organic on it? You can connect this. You can have a, conne um, a business account or a personal account and you can start labeling. You want to use as many hashtags as possible. So this, this one here would say blueberries, blueberries, vegetables, um, farm, agriculture, Delaware. I would fresh, um, fruit. I would use several hashtags. People will find you, and they search for that. There are people who are out on, on Instagram that search for nothing but blue things. It's just, it's crazy. Um, so it doesn't matter why they searched you. You want them to find you, and then they learn a little bit about you. They, you can tell your story with these pictures. You can have a picture of your child at your farm. Um, so this is a way of being able to tell your story. And I'm going fast. I'm, I'm getting carried away. Pinterest, same thing. Um, I'm going to skip that. Facebook pages we're going to talk about in two sessions. Close-up pictures of people, happy, smiling faces. You want to use those. Which is a better Apple picture? I would argue that it would be this one because it's showing smiling children. It's showing some wholesome. The other one's not bad, but the other one's better. Um, 
Here are some sources to for free websites. I've created a Weebly. You could have a photography website and just take nothing but farm photographs. So this is Wix. This is another free website. These are very easy to create a website if you want. Um, you can also do an eBlogger and WordPress. These are just blogs that you can use. Uh, be a guest blogger. This is a gentleman who is a farmer who said his farm is not corporately owned and he was a guest blogger on CNN. So you can use, um, this is uh, Christy Vanderwin Wright and she is a, um, talks about her farm experience. She talked about her wedding and why she got married on her farm and et cetera, et cetera. So these are just some really good things that you can do. Farmer Dance Daughter is the name of her blog. Here are some websites that you can Google for resources. Common Ground, uh, excellent, excellent U.S. Farmers, Ranchers and Alliance, and Farmers Feed Us. Be, be as transparent as you can. Talk about what you do. Try not to hide anything. A lot of us have to be biosecure. We, so we're behind closed doors. So then that's when some of the mystery begins. But if you can, be as transparent as possible. Tell your story. I'm not going to have time to talk about Oprah Winfrey and this uh, Cargill did, a, did an expose. So they actually stepped forward and allowed Oprah, Oprah's crew to come in and film a um, meat processing plant. And it was a fabulous. If you get a chance, definitely search Slaughterhouse Video and watch how this woman here, um, Nicole, talks, talks to the media. She did an excellent job. So suggestions, capitalize on your family his, history, your love of the land, use your photos, blog, use social media, try to write guest columns, offer your location for school tours if that's, if that's feasible, try to um, maybe do some sponsorship in the community. So what, one way to advocate would be to, you know, um, support a, a a team, a baseball, softball team, or something like that. When you're using images, title your images. Um, so you can look at this a little bit at your leisure because I'm going over. Here's some more resources here. These two here, This I can't say enough about this website, the Center for Food Integrity. You also, as a resource here, the department, your, your local department of agriculture will have resources, DDA, MDA. Um, talk with your state, they will also have some. But this organization here has some terrific resources on how to respond to maybe hot topics if there's breaking news about, say, glyphosate or something like that. They will give you some tools on how the best way to respond is. So I'm just going to, Ag is America is another website that has a website. They have a Twitter account and a Facebook page and they are promoting agriculture. They're connected with the land-grant university, so it's a very good organization to follow. And with that, I'm done, and we want to go to a wrap-up. Thank you for watching our archived presentation of our Wednesday webinar. If you would like to see more archived Wednesday webinars, please visit our YouTube channel, or to find a schedule of upcoming live webinars, visit our website.